All right, Sean, I think today we're going to skip the intro, and you're just going to go ahead and drop the beat. (laughs) (laughs) DJ, play that funky music. Or is it the melody? (laughs) Yeah, go ahead and do that. This is where you'll paste that in. Ready? Go. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. I'm Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus. And that makes us the minimalists. The minimalists. We... (laughs) Uh, Welcome to episode number 15. We're calling today's episode Consumerism. We have some questions about consumption and and consumerism. But before that, let's uh, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Ryan, we have uh, a tour coming up. We do. We will be on the road, everyone. Uh, We're going to be on the road all throughout May in more than a dozen cities. But even if we're not coming to your city, our documentary is. So if you want to find the theater closest to you, because you want to see the documentary, go to minimalismfilm.com and click on See the Film. And you can find, there's a little map there, and you can find the, the theater in Saginaw, Michigan, or, or Lansing, Michigan, or East Lansing, Michigan. We have a lot of showings in Michigan, I'm hoping, as I'm saying this. <laughs> uh, if you're in Maryland, or Hawaii, or um, New Hampshire, I mean, we, we have uh, screens and. I think maybe all 50 states now, if not really, really close to that. So find a theater close to you. Now, here, here's the catch. Uh, this is one night only in, in most cities, so it's not going to be showing for a long time. So you have to get your tickets in advance. If you don't get your tickets in advance, the screening won't happen. So we really need your help there. Yeah, if you're like me, you wait till the last minute, and it will be too late if you wait till the last minute. Right, because it won't be there until we, until we have enough, enough people who have reserved their tickets. Thankfully, we already have thousands of people who have done that, but many cities still need a lot of help. So do us a favor. Or help us out. If you want to see this film, you can check out the trailer at minimalismfilm.com. And if you love the trailer, you love what we're doing, uh, you can get some pretty cheap tickets. You can also come see me and Ryan on the road. If you go to uh, theminimalists.com slash tour, you can see all of the cities. You know, uh, it's less than two months, Ryan, and we will be on on the road. I can't wait. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yes, someone on, on Periscope said, Denver. Uh, yes, the, th- the film will be in Denver. We have several screenings in Denver. We won't be there personally, but we'll be on the big screen, which is awesome. So we'll be in a bunch of places. Uh, Ryan, let's go ahead and get started. We have a, a bunch of voicemails. Our for- first voicemail question is from Anna in Missouri. I'm just trying to be more careful. I'm trying to uh, be more careful with what I buy and try to buy better quality clothing that will last longer. And uh, But I don't want to support uh, stores that do uh, send their stuff overseas and take advantage of other people that work in sweatshops. What do you recommend? Uh, do you, are you guys know of stores where you can shop that are not involved in sweatshops? Congratulations on being more intentional with what you're trying to do here, because I think it's really important for, for us to focus on not, not only bringing less into our lives, but being focused on the things that we do bring into our lives, that they're intentional, they're deliberate, and they're, most important, responsible, right? Not, not only is it important for it to be appropriate for our, our lives, but we need to be responsible for, for the things that, that we, we consume, so minimalism isn't about not consuming. It's about uh, consuming with intention. So I'm going to recommend a few things that I do personally. And uh, a reader a few weeks back, or a listener on this podcast a few weeks back, recommended that we uh, uh, visit a website. So I'm going to start with that, uh, buyitonce.com, which is actually buy-it-once.com. Um, I'm looking at the website right now. And uh, talk about they, they really just talk about buying high quality products, buying durable products. They're going to last a long time. So the idea is, if you need 
something for the rest of your life if you can buy it once as opposed to buying it dozens or or hundreds of times uh, throughout the course of your life, you're going to be consuming more responsibly. They also have uh, ethical purchasing on their websites. They talk about the eth- ethics behind the goods that they recommend. And so uh, buyitonce.com is, is a great place to, to start. I also advocate buying things used. I, I often will shop, if it's not a thrift shop, it's an online thrift shop like eBay or, or Craigslist. And here's the thing about buying something used. Yes, if you have a good that was made in a, uh, a irresponsible way, well, and then you're getting ready to throw it away, if you at least reappropriate that thing so that something else doesn't need to be created, then then I think you're, you're in a good position to, to um, <clears throat> c- consume something or to reuse something that otherwise would just end up in, in a landfill. So, And I'm going to recommend you try, try to buy things used, buy things that are high quality, and uh, check, out, check out whether it's you know, eBay or next time you need to buy a shirt, which, by the way, you can get a you know, high-end designer clothes on, on eBay for a really inexpensive price. You know, they're, they're gently used, but... Ryan, isn't that what all the kids are doing today anyway? They, they have <laughs> They're to have, buying gently used. They have to t- have the tear in their jeans. Yeah, and, it's like that's how it comes new nowadays. Like you got holes and tears and frays and, yeah, collars missing and things like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, I think it's impossible to to leave a, uh, you know, a zero imprint. And, and I know, man, uh, just saying that, I know I'm good. We're going to have a lot of... Uh, Zero waste, folks. Um, yeah, counter, it's, it's, counter this, but it's certainly <clears throat> impractical. Yes, yeah. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is, even with a zero waste type culture, if I go to a store and get a cup of coffee, um, and I bring a mason jar, there's still a lot of waste that goes with that cup of coffee that I got that was poured into my mason jar. Um, so, I guess what I'm really trying to say here is that I will try to have as little of an impact as possible. I will uh, buy goods that last a long time. Because like a computer, for example, it's something that you and I use in our everyday lives. It's, right. we, we run a blog. Um, all of our business is on the internet. Um, that's how we have met most of our friends now uh, on the internet. So, it's a great you know, tool. Yeah. So it's a great tool that we use. Um, but there are chemicals in this laptop. There are uh, metals in here that, that will pollute the earth once it is uh, extinguished once I have thrown it away. And, and I, uh, unless there, I don't know of anywhere where you can send it off to recycle. If there is, let us know, send us a comment if we, you know, where you could send your computers off to be recycled. But my point yeah. is, is when I go to buy a tool like that, I, I'm, actually Apple, Apple does, they, they have a recycle program themselves. Yeah, right. So, so even better, it's like, I will go out of my way to buy something that, uh, will last a long time. And then, yeah, if I can recycle it afterwards, I will recycle it. Yeah, f- finding, I mean, I think that's the other end of the equation, right? We're talking about bringing things into your to your life responsibly, but then letting go of them responsibly. It, it's one thing mm, to hold on to point. it in perpetuity because we feel like, okay, uh, I, I'm holding on to this, uh, t- to this thing because I'm afraid that I'm going to fill a landfill with it. Well, then your house just eventually becomes a pseudo landfill. Right. If you, if you, and so finding uh, ethical ways to let go, realizing sometimes some things are going to end up in a landfill. That's okay as long as what you're bringing to that landfill is radically reduced compared to what the average is. And, and so what we're what we're advocating here is a responsible way of letting go. I noticed a comment on here. Someone um, said uh, Patagonia, and I think that that's a a great point. Patagonia yeah. makes really high end clothes, and they encourage you to buy their clothes used, mm-hmm. and, and uh, because they know that their stuff is high quality and it lasts it lasts for a very long time. So you're not replacing that t shirt every year because you know, once you buy something from them. Uh, actually, I was just talking to to Bex, my partner, uh, this weekend. She used to live in um, Ketchikan, Alaska which is the rainiest place in North America. I mean, it's unbelievable. Like, people there just leave their windshield wipers on. And the, there's like 12 days a year or something like that where it doesn't rain. People still all have their windshield wipers on because they're, they're just, just conditioned. used to it, yeah. Yeah. And, and so she bought a Patagonia raincoat. Um, I think it was, uh, so it was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Oh, wow. And we were just in Seattle this, this past weekend and she was wearing it there as well. She, it's the same Patagonia and it looks freaking brand new. And, and, um, so, so buying something like that and she, she used to wear it every single day in catch a kid every, wow. cause all it did was rain. Yeah. And, and so it was her sort of built in windshield wiper. It was always on. And, and so she realized that uh, I'm never going to buy – if something happens to this coat and I, it gets ripped or damaged somehow, 
I mean, she's had it for a dozen years or whatever. She's just going to go and buy a very similar coat made by Patagonia because she knows she's going to get another 10, 20 years out of that same coat, which is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Our next voicemail question is from Austin in San Francisco. Uh, in your guys' book, Living a Meaningful or Live a Meaningful Life, you recommend a, a specific juicer, the uh, the Omega J eight thousand four. And when I went to go and buy one of those, I noticed that there is now an Omega J eight thousand six, uh, which is the number one bestseller for juicers and looks all fancy, but it costs seventy dollars more. And I'm usually pretty good about being conscious of what I buy, but where do I draw the line between spending more money? on better things to improve my life and, uh, and getting sucked into consumerism like this. Austin. Well, I got the uh, juicers pulled up here, man. <laughs> and I'm comparing them. Man, you the, would be a total chump if you didn't go with the 8,006. <laughs> Everyone is going with the 8,006 Looks like now. the cool kids are getting the more expensive one. Um, no, man, there's no difference. Between, I mean, you're talking about uh, the juicers specifically. There's no difference b- between these two juicers, except one is stainless steel and the other is not. So if the aesthetic... Uh, of uh, if white uh, doesn't bother you as far as this aesthetic goes, then get the cheaper one, the stainless steel one, seventy bucks more. And there's probably someone out there who like has this beautiful stainless steel kitchen and everything stainless steel, and they would totally spend seventy dollars more just to get the stainless steel juicer. And you know what? That's okay, right? But if you're talking about functionality, like me, I'm I'm, I'm going to go for the functionality of it. Uh, yeah, the the cheaper one does the same exact thing, but it's not stainless steel. I mean, obviously, this doesn't hold true with every single case when you go to buy an item. Like, I totally went out. Uh, I had a magic bullet. It was like, I forget what RPMs or what wattage it was. It was like a real high wattage. And we were I went, talking before this, and he swore, he swore that it was 800 horsepower. <laughs> <laughs> I drove it to the he office just this morning. some wheels to it. <laughs> Put some, air, uh, some airplane wings on it. No, so it was like, you know, 800, 800 uh, watts or what, whatever the heck it was. And it was uh, $50 more than the Magic Bullet that was 200 watts less. So when I went to go buy this, I was like, you know what? I didn't look at any of the reviews. My fault. Shame on me. I didn't look at any of the reviews. I just thought, okay, I know that the Magic Bullet works well. Um, I've seen him in the past. I went for the uh, one that was 200 horsepower, <laughs> the one that was 200 watts less, and it's and it's kind of stinks. I'm not gonna lie. Like the uh, when I had the one that was 200 horsepower more, that was uh, before it broke. It, it it definitely worked a lot better. So it still works. It still does its job. It does take longer. Um, I really wish I would have done the research and just went ahead and spent the 40 or 50 bucks more that it cost. So in any of these situations, it's about doing the research, going back to consuming responsibly. Uh, it was my fault for not doing the research in that scenario. Shame on me. I will learn from that lesson and uh, do some nice comparisons Um you know, when, when I need to buy something in the future, but with this, with specifically awesome with the juicer, dude, if you don't care about whether it's stainless steel or not, like get the one that's cheaper. It does the same exact thing as a stainless steel one. Yeah. And, and Ryan's actually talking about two high end juicers here. These are masticating juicers, which they're, they're not your run of the mill, $50 crappy juicer that's right. going to break on you. It, th- these are both great juicers, but Ryan's right. The main difference here, the only difference that I can tell is uh, the color, and you're going to pay you're going to pay seventy bucks more for that that stainless steel. But in in some cases, Ryan's right. You you need to do a comparison, and you need to look and say, okay, this model of X versus Y model, uh, the the Y model is seventy dollars more. What additional features does that have? Okay, it has these seven additional features. Sounds great. But are those features going to add value to your life? Uh, the, the immediate example that comes to my mind right now, Ryan, is coffee makers. Mm. When I, was, I was staying at Airbnb this, this weekend uh, over in Seattle, and uh, they had this you know, high-end coffee maker that must have had – it looked like you know, something from the Star Trek Enterprise main uh, console. It had all these buttons on it. And, Computer, one cup of coffee, please. <laughs> right. Earl Grey, black. <laughs> and and so there were, <laughs> there were all these <laughs> options and Becca looked at me and said uh there's a button on there that said like strong or extra strong and I'm like that should the coffee maker itself shouldn't determine whether or not the coffee <laughs> is strong the amount of coffee vert to water ratio should determine and to me 
Like all those extra features, and that coffee maker is probably several hundred dollars more than a V60 pour over uh, that, that I use that I usually travel with, but forgot to uh, this weekend. And and you know what? All those extra features actually get in the way of creating something that I want to create. And so sometimes you have to think about the additional you know, bells and whistles. <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> the bells and whistles. I was thinking about when we were uh, working at Telecom and that guy came in and he was like, all right, I just want I just want you to sell me a basic cell phone. I don't want no I don't want no phones with bells or whistles on it. And then employee we had Mike, he was like, uh-huh. Oh, you're in Luxor. We just sold our last phone with a whistle on it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so 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 keep in mind that sometimes those extra seven features or extra one feature is worth the additional cost to you. And and whether that's a, a you know, higher wattage or it is uh, the, a whistle. A, a whistle. A coffee maker with a whistle. <laughs> yes, you may you may want that. Sometimes uh well speaking of whistles, I mean literally I hate those damn teapots that have a whistle on them because they always whistle at <laughs> so the you, most inopportune time. So you want a right? teapot without a whistle? I want a teapot. With, <laughs> okay. I would pay more for less whistle. <laughs> and and so yes, I I would encourage you to keep that in mind. Sometimes those extra extra features will either get in the way or they're not worth the extra money. You're like, yeah, I would pay two or three more dollars for that extra feature. Oh wait, it's a hundred dollars more. Of course that's not worth it to me. So, so keep that in mind when, when you're making your next purchase, but con- congratulations, Austin, you're making that, that conscious decision is okay, which one is appropriate for me? And that's the question you're asking. And, and by identifying what is appropriate to you, you can figure out which model works best for you. And by the way, you're looking at some high-end juicers right now, and these are juicers that are going to last you 10, 20 years uh, as long as you take care of them and, and, and clean them. Austin, I notice you're in San Francisco. We have uh, two tour stops there. It's a, a double feature. Unfortunately, both of those are sold out. But we're going to send you a couple tickets. We have some other screenings in the Bay Area. we love to... Uh, uh, thanks for your question. Thank you for your question by sending you a couple tickets to a local screening of Minimalism, a documentary about the important things. Our next question is from Joe in Cincinnati. The lingering question that continues to bother me deals with one's identity. Being a self-proclaimed geek, flirting with the philosophy of minimalism, I find myself with enough internal conflict. Keeping your geek street cred involves playing video games, reading comics, watching TV shows and movies. Uh, Many of us spend time to learn the entire history of completely fictional civilizations. So with all the blood, sweat, and tears, yes, there's a lot of tears, it becomes a part of one's identity. So you can see how this inherent consumerism becomes part of the culture. We have entire conventions based on our heroes where you're excited to shell out the money for an overpriced ticket so you can go inside and get this buy stuff. Or you then wait in line for three and a half hours to pay for a photo op with your favorite zombie killer or dwarf. So with the understanding and realization that what you do or do not own does not define who you are, how does one minimally express fandom? You know, I, as he was talking about being a, a geek, I was showing my my sticker to the camera here, a little monkey sticker <laughs> that Ella gave to me this morning. She was on the potty, and she gets a, a sticker for going to the potty. And, and you get a she, sticker, too, for going to the potty? Yeah. Nice. She, she likes to give me stickers for using the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, yes, I, I have my monkey sticker Your on. Your potty sticker. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so you all can know that I didn't yeah. pee my pants today. Joe, you talked about a, a bunch of stuff here, and it's a, a very well-worded uh, uh, question. And... and uh, what, what I love about uh, it seems like you scripted this thing out, and and I'm grateful for that because uh, the quality of our questions will lead to hopefully better quality answers uh, as we're going through this. Ryan, he he was talking first about identity. He used mm. that word identity, yeah. And I can tell you that what you're talking about in terms of identity identity is identifying with something that you care about, something you're passionate about, something you're interested in, something that excites you, where as opposed to how most of us think of our identity, which is that that title that's written on our business card, mm-hmm. what our job title is. One of the first questions we ask each other is, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And then we spend the next 5, 10, 15 minutes laboring on about that vocation that earns us a paycheck. And there's nothing wrong with earning a paycheck, but I'd rather have my identity wrapped up in something that's meaningful to me, whether that's you know going to these conventions or 
or, or living a lifestyle that is in accordance with my interests mm-hmm. rather than uh, just constantly pursuing a paycheck to, to make ends meet. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't see anything wrong with making money, but I definitely want I, I definitely want my identity to be wrapped up in something that I care about. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, it sounds like Joe identifies a lot with being a, a geek. Uh, he, he, is that, that's what he said, right? A self-proclaimed geek. I think so. Sean, is that what he said? <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I would say, yeah, like you said, Josh, there's a lot of things covered there. I would speak to first uh, the convention he talked about. Man, you know, it costs so much for us to uh, go to these conventions, these Comic-Cons or whatever type of conferences they are. You know... If you're spending four or five hundred bucks on an experience and it's something you really love to do, um, then I I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Um, I certainly wouldn't spend five hundred bucks or that much money on a Comic Con ticket, um, but I know plenty of people who would. So I, I you know first and foremost I would say yeah keep keep uh, gaining experiences in your life. I mean that's that's why we're here on this on this earth. I mean that's the only thing we can do is. Is, is is have as many experiences as possible. And I think that's the best way that one can grow. When it comes to all the memorabilia, man, you know, uh, Josh and I might differ a little, a little bit on this. I always say if there's someone who just absolutely loves collecting Fabergé eggs or absolutely loves to collect comic books and comic book memorabilia, and it's truly what makes you happy and what brings you joy, then do it. Uh, you're a minimalist. I give you permission to do that and be a minimalist. But Joe, I'll be honest with you, man. You know, you you said in the you know towards the end of your question that a lot of this uh, or that this has brought on a lot of tears. So there's obviously something here that isn't uh, that isn't aligning with your your values and beliefs. And and you know, if I was you, where where would I start? I would start with I don't know. I mean, is it the stuff? that is making you feel overwhelmed? Is it the money uh, that is making you feel overwhelmed? Is it the time that you're spending on this stuff? Is that making you feel overwhelmed? But if you're looking for uh, uh, somewhere to start, if you're looking for a way to still have this hobby, to still live this lifestyle and uh, practice minimalism, I would start with that question that Josh always talks about, that, that we always talk about is how might your life be better with less stuff? Yeah, but especially with with the tears, unless they are tears of joy, because you're you're getting so much joy out of the experiences, right? <laughs> and generally, that's what what's happening. And and just to echo what Ryan said, I wouldn't confuse the the memorabilia, the the stuff, the trinkets with the experience. And right now, it seems to me like you're blurring the lines between experience and the trinkets. Some of those trinkets may actually augment your experience, and that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes some of the stuff that we bring into our lives helps us enjoy that aspect of our life even more. Sometimes those things just get in the way, or they're neutral. And if they're neutral, they're effectively getting in the way. Mm-hmm. And and so I, I find that when I, I sort of bring in the accoutrements of, uh, of memorabilia or the experience, the best time to do that is if it actually improves the experience. And if it doesn't, then I'm more, I want to be more focused on the experience. I want to put more time, attention, resources. Someone on, on our, our Periscope right now just said that money is the transfer uh, of energy. Mm. A- and if I were, were to append that at all, money is, is, shows how we want to focus. Right. And on what we want to focus. So it's a resource that we use, but it's one of many resources that we use. Uh, money's one, one resource, but you're also spending your time and your attention on, on, on these things. And so, yes, a photo op, waiting in line for three hours for a photo op with your favorite character or whatever, that's an, actu- that, that's an experience uh, uh, because you get to interact with the people who are around you. You get to finally uh, uh, go up and have the photo, which, by the way, the photo can be stored digitally. It doesn't need to be another thing that's taking up space and attention in, in your life, but you can still have access to it. I mean, we all post that stuff on social media now anyway, so mm-hmm. it'll, it'll be out there in the ether sort of in perpetuity. And uh, I'm also, to, to Ryan's point about, about the, the collecting of stuff, uh, it reminds me of a uh, Derek Sivers essay, which we'll put a link to this in, in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. And uh, the, the title of the essay, I'm not going to read the, the whole thing, but I will summarize it. Uh, it's Happy, Smart, and Useful. And he has this Venn diagram with, with three circles with those three things. And, 
And uh, basically, three things to consider when making large, life-size decisions. Well, number one, does it make you happy? Right now, now, if I were to comment on that, and I, I would say, happiness shouldn't be the point. Living a meaningful life, a purpose-driven life, is the point, and happiness tends to be a byproduct of that. So, when thinking about happiness, don't chase the happiness; chase the meaning and get happiness out of that. Uh, the second uh, part of the Venn diagram is what's smart, meaning what's good for you in the long term. And the third thing is what's useful to others. Mm. And, and if you, you find the intersection of those three, that's when you, you'll find something that, that you're going to create a peak experience out of. Because if you're collecting just for yourself because it makes you happy in the moment, but maybe it's not good for you long term, or maybe it's not useful for others at all, mm-hmm. then eventually you're going to feel a source of discontent. Mm-hmm. Uh, similarly, if you experience something that is good for you long term, but maybe it doesn't ever make you happy, you never feel sort of fulfilled by it, well, then, and it's not useful to anyone else, um, then you know what? It's, it, it, I, I think of running for me. Like, I don't enjoy running. I know it's probably good for me, uh, but there are other ways for me to exercise. So it's not going to make me happy, and, and it's probably not that useful to others relative to other exercises. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I think of running where, yeah, it is, it's smart. The smart thing to do is to exercise, but there are other ways to accomplish that task. Uh, the final thing, is it useful to others? I think that's important, but if you're just giving, 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 eventually you're going to be empty. And so you need to get as well. And, and I think that's what those first two uh, uh, circles uh, will, w- would recommend is you have something that makes you happy, something that is good for you long term, something that's smart, and, and something that is useful for the, for the greater good. And if you can find the intersection, not just of two of those, but of all three of those, and if your collection of stuff fits into all three of those, I think of a, you know, there are like toy museums. Yeah. And, and that, that's one way it can be useful for a lot of people. It doesn't have to be a museum where thousands of people show up. You can have a collection that's useful to all the people in your, your group or your, your tribe, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And so if you can find the intersection of those three, Three things, then I think you're going to be able to justify uh, a lot easier uh, the things that you bring into your life because they actually are going to make you happy, and those tears will turn into tears of joy. Then, yeah, and all those things that you have right now, I know a lot of that you don't have to have ownership of to enjoy. Meaning, when you go to these comic con event, uh, comic con conventions. Uh, you will have access to, I'm sure, stacks and stacks of comic books that you can look at. I'm sure a lot of these are also online. Um, So that's just something else to think about, too. A lot of the stuff that we bring into our lives uh, that we think we need to have ownership of to enjoy, uh, really, sometimes we just need to have a little bit of access to it. Our next question is from Tristan in Phoenix. I was curious as to whether you guys shop at Costco or Sam's Club or anything like that, because on the one hand, I see you not wanting to buy a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need in bulk, but then there are those items that you can buy at those places that you do need, like toilet paper and paper towels and uh, stuff like that. So I was just curious if you guys did that, because I could also see it on the other side being a time and money saver, but then also it would increase the clutter in your house and the amount of stuff you'd have to take care of. You know, I think we can answer that question without a problem, but by by me answering that question or by Ryan answering that question, it's not really going to necessarily help you specifically. Yes, I will buy a few things in bulk uh, because I don't think of money as my only resource. The space that I have as a resource my time that I'm going to use to go to the store repeatedly. Like, imagine if every time you needed to use toilet paper, you went to the store. Um, it would be that, insane. It would just take up so much of your time, right? right? And so I buy toilet paper in bulk. I, I tend to buy... Uh, I don't use many paper towels, but I'll buy paper towels in bulk, and I usually have to buy them maybe once a year. And I'll make sure I ask some important questions first, though. You have to identify what bulk is, right? I'm not going to buy a literal ton of toilet paper. I don't have the space for that. But I do have the space for a, a larger bulk container of, of toilet paper. And, and so um, I, 
I'm going to ask that question. Do, do I have the space for it? it? And then if I do have the space for it, the next question I ask after that is, is this getting in my way? And, and so you mentioned clutter there uh, a moment ago, Tristan. Um, yes, it, um, if it gets in the way, then it is clutter. For me, I have to get it out of the way. Uh, I, for me, it's out of sight, out of mind, but I want to be able to store it, to stow it in a place that is never going, going to get in my way. So that's going to help you identify how much bulk is appropriate uh, for your life. And then the other question that's important to me is, does it bother me? Now, as a person who, who has a, a very mild form of OCD, everything <laughs> bothers me. So, so does it bother me enough that it is that it is in my way that it's sort of activating the back of my mind and and does it seem problematic and so I will buy bulk things uh, when when I do need them and we often make a distinction here these aren't just in case items I won't buy bulk just in case I'm gonna uh, have some toilet paper just in case no toilet paper is just for when I know I'm gonna need toilet paper and, and most of you know that you're going to need toilet paper. That is a just-for-win item. Now, buying the, the next just-in-case item is a little bit different, something I might use in a hypothetical future, but I'm not sure when, and if I'm honest with myself, I'm probably never going to use it. That is different. There are maybe half a dozen things that, that, I, that I have in bulk, uh, toilet paper, paper towels, hot sauce, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love some hot sauce. Yeah. And, uh, between Becca and and myself, like uh, we must go through, I don't know, a gallon a month of hot sauce. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, no, I yeah, I don't I don't buy much many things in bulk. But I mean, that's because Mariah and I don't need to buy a lot of things in bulk. I mean, her question was, do we shop at Sam's Club or Costco? Mariah and I went to Costco once because she got a free membership through work. She was like, oh, we can go and get some bulk vegetables and some other stuff for smoothies. And, you know, at the end of the day, the the produce we got, it wasn't like the best produce. I'm not putting their produce down. I'm just saying that we, we would prefer to get it somewhere else. It didn't save us that much money when it came to buying produce. Oh, and by the way, like there was only two of us, so some of it went bad. Yeah, I think so, that's a good point. Bulk perishables is generally a bad idea, unless yeah. you know. I mean, well, we were making a gonna, bunch of smoothies and stuff, yeah, and thought we were going to use it all, but yeah, sure. I totally agree. Had to learn the lesson the hard hard way there. So, uh, yeah, we did it once. It didn't really work out for us, but you know, at the end of the day, if you got a family of seven, um, it might it might make sense to go to Costco and buy all that stuff in bulk. It it, it just depends on what your circumstances are. Uh, certainly. Uh, I don't look for those places. Um, I don't go out of my way to go to those places. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting. I don't think I, I – I can't tell you the last time I was in a Sam's Club or a Costco. I know that Costco uh, – I used to listen to, to Clark Howard's radio show a lot. He's a consumer advocate. And he he would talk about you know, some, of the, some of the best deals that you could buy on random things. I, I, even automobiles they did at the time at oh, Costco. Wow. I mean, and, you know, big screen TVs before the, the price was, was relatively inexpensive. And, and while we're not advocating buying any of those things, it, it is part of the, the conscious consumption process it, it is, is the price and making sure you aren't overspending. I'm, st- I'm all for spending more money for higher quality. I'm not in favor of spending more money for no reason at all. And, and so sometimes these, these bulk places, l- like a Costco, will help you save some money. When I buy in bulk, it tends to be things I can get in bulk at, at a place like the Good Food Store or Target or right. uh, my local market. And so, yeah, I would just keep that in mind. What, what is this going to be? Uh, is it a just-for-win item versus just-in-case? And am I actually going to be able to use this you know, for the things that are perishables? Eh, maybe not. And, and you could have a lot of waste involved. So, so be responsible, ask the right questions, and then feel good about buying in bulk once you've asked those, those right questions because you're saving time, which is a non-renewable resource. Now, we'd love to hear what y'all have to say. So if you have a, a comment about consumerism or shopping or buying in bulk or Comic Con or anything else, then uh, feel free to leave us a comment. Now, now, keep in mind, we air far more comments on this podcast 
than we do questions. We get a lot of voicemail questions, and I'm sorry, but we just can't possibly answer all of them. We have a huge bank uh, of, of back questions that we will go and, and answer eventually. So feel free to, to comment. You're much more likely to have your comment out there. Plus, we want other people's perspective. Like, Ryan and I are the experts because we decided to call ourselves the minimalists, and we've been living this lifestyle, a very intentional lifestyle, for the last six or so years. Uh, but we certainly don't have all the answers. But when we combined, you know, half a million people who are listening to this thing w- with us, we might get most of the answers. So we'd love to get your voicemail comments. That's the best way to comment. Just give us a call. Leave us a voicemail at 406-219-7839. And what we'll do is we'll air our favorite comments on um, and our favorite minimalism tips on, on an upcoming episode. And if your voicemail is selected, if we do select your, your comment, we will... Uh, send you an autographed copy of one of our books, either uh, Essential, which is our essay collection, or Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life, or my favorite, Everything That Remains. Okay, let's move on to our, yes. our iTunes comment of the week. <laughs> All right, this one comes from King of Cinema out of Santa Barbara, California. King of Cinema writes, We are in one of the most beautiful places in the U.S., But it seems like all I can think about is money. We are spending too much to keep up with the Joneses. And we are paying so much for a place that we are really just using to store all our stuff. Mm. After discovering your podcast, I've spent the past three weeks using a lot of the ideals you created. And the result has been amazing. Keep on rocking. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thanks, King of Cinema. You keep on rocking. Appreciate that comment. Yeah, we'll send you a copy of Everything That Remains, and, and thank you to everyone else who has left us an iTunes review. Uh, we've seen a lot of really awesome, positive, honest reviews, some really clever ones too, so feel free to get creative. We'll select our, our favorites for future episodes, uh, future episode iTunes comments of the week. Okay, let's move on to our hashtag ask the minimalists lightning round we are on twitter and instagram and now periscope uh, looking <laughs> at this this camera right now and it's looking at ryan um we are uh, on twitter and instagram and periscope at the minimalists and facebook.com slash the minimalist you can ask us your questions there all right our first question is from ann ann writes you talk about how following your passion is crappy advice But cultivating your passion is great advice. Can you talk more about the difference and why one is better? We hear this advice all the time, right? Uh, I was over at the university recently, and I saw a poster on the wall. So so where we are, our office here at Asymmetrical Press, which is just a room, is uh, uh, the startup incubator here. It's situated across the river from the University of Montana, but we're we're sort of by proxy part of, of the university here. And um, I was over there, uh, we were doing a radio interview, and they had a poster in the hallway that said, uh, follow your passion. And it's like one of those successory kind of posters. It sounds great. It sounds like great advice. And, and you hear it sort of propagated on blogs and self-help books and, and from professors and, yeah. and, and well-doers, people who want to give you good advice because it sounds like great advice, but when you think about it, it's crappy advice. Follow your passion presupposes that you were born to do one thing, that you were meant to be a yoga instructor or a teacher or an astronaut or a writer or a plumber or an electrician, but the truth is there are dozens of things that any of us can be passionate about, and so the better advice is to cultivate a passion. Now, what does that mean? What's, what's, different, what's the difference between follow your passion and, and cultivate your passion. Uh, and first off, we have a whole chapter in our book, Essential. I'm going to send you a copy of, of that book, uh, a whole chapter in there about, about passion and success and how we can identify that. Uh, but if I were to look at cultivating a passion, it really means finding something that aligns with your values, something that aligns with your interests, and being willing to put in the hard work. Don't confuse excitement with passion. Mm. Just because you get excited about an idea doesn't mean you're necessarily passionate about it. Be willing to drudge through the drudgery to get to the other side to actually experience a payoff. But when it gets boring or mundane or tedious or monotonous, then you know that you have to continue to work through that. Because if you don't work through it, you'll never get the real payoff. The real passion comes 
after the hard work, after the drudgery, after being willing to, to put in the time and, and, and attention required to create something meaningful. And the cool thing about that is there are dozens of things that you can be passionate about. So some of you may say, I have no idea what I'm passionate about. That's okay, because there isn't a thing for you to be passionate about. In fact, over your lifetime, you can be passionate about many things. Uh, The key is to find one thing, put in the work, cultivate that into a real passion. All right. Our next question is right along the same topic about passion. It's from Danny. And Danny writes, I am struggling more with how to channel my creativity into one project full bore and not bounce from one thing to another in an endless list of options. How do you guys personally choose which creative outlet to concentrate on? And please don't just have an answer of do what brings you the most joy. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? Danny listens to our uh, podcast a lot, doesn't he? (laughs) It's funny because I I would say if someone gives you that advice, uh, do what makes you happy. Wow, that's more bad advice. If someone says follow your passions, I don't know what I'm passionate about. Just do what makes you do happy. Do what gives man. you the most joy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. You know who does what makes them happy, what gives them the most joy? Uh, Ella does. Kids. Yes. All a, from a two and a man. half year old. Right. Or no from No, no, it's, that's it's, what it is. it's no it's a reptilian. Sure. It's the reptilian brain. Yeah. It's that that mammalian. Uh, what is it, prefrontal cortex, that makes us just pursue more and more and more impulse mm. and act on impulse. Doing what makes you happy is is not a recipe for long-term happiness, surprisingly, right? Yeah. Because doing what feels good in the moment generally doesn't feel good long-term. Mm. You know, if I were to just do what made me, you know, that brought me joy, well... Well, we wouldn't be doing this podcast right now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, I mean, we, we, ha- we, have, we have, you know, mammalian impulses for sure, and it's okay to act on those. <laughs> but, but the truth is that, that I, want to, I want my short-term actions to align with my long-term values. And, and when I can align those two, it may be drudgery in the moment, but often that outcome is going to be far greater than simply acting on impulse. Uh, this morning, Ella would not let me take her pea-soaked shirt off, and and she was fighting it, and and you know she was acting on it and she was yelling, and we, that's what we no and like go, going a little crazy. Mm-hmm. But that's what that's when we act strictly on impulse. We we act just like that. It's okay to be childlike. It's not okay to be childish, mm. and and I like to make that make that distinction. So, when I'm trying to find something to cultivate into a passion, I, I have two recommendations here. One is pick a thing, and two is for me it needs to to align with growth and giving. Am I does this task does this create creative endeavor allow me to grow as an individual? And does it allow me to contribute to the greater good, contribute to the world around me in a meaningful way? If it fulfills both criteria, then I know it's something that's worthwhile. Mm. Yeah, I think about Tony Robbins, uh, the ultimate success formula. Uh-huh. So, you know, when I'm trying to choose something to focus on, or if I'm, if I'm faced with a bunch of options, I'm looking at each option and I'm kind of applying this formula of, you know, the first step is figure out what your outcome is. So if I want to pursue guitar, you know, and that's something I want to make time for, then I've got to think about what that outcome is. Like, am I going, is my outcome to be in a band and to play in a live show, or is it just so I can learn some chords and maybe, you know, play a few songs around the campfire? Like really, what is my outcome? And is that, how is that outcome going to affect my life? So for me, uh, you know, let's take guitar, for example, it's not something I put a whole lot of time into right now. Because I would love to learn how to play guitar, but at the end of the day, um, it's not going to uh, give me a better outcome than if I am here recording this podcast. Certainly. You know, it, so, it's, it's interesting you say I, I learned to play guitar in my mid to late 20s. I was 27 when I bought my first guitar. And I say learn to play guitar. I wouldn't ever play in front of a, a, a crowd of more than myself. And I, I was writing a novel at the time. Uh, it's called As the Decade Fades, and the main character was a, a singer or is a singer songwriter, and 
was, is, is he still out there, man? I don't know, man. I guess you'll have to get to the ending. <laughs> Um, no, um, so in a, as a decade fades, uh, Jody Grafton is the main character, and he's a, a singer songwriter. And I wanted to be able to identify with with that that sort of creative process. And so my outcome wasn't being able to play in front, in front of a group of people; it was be, be able to understand the intricacies of that, mm. how someone else might approach this instrument, and and uh, and get better at it. What's the process of of improving? And so I think that formula is important. What is what is my outcome? Is the most powerful question that we rarely ever ask ourselves. We step back, and that that can go for picking a creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. It can go when we're about to get into an argument with our significant other. What is your outcome? Is your real outcome to to show that you're right? Because even if you're right and everyone's mad, then you're still wrong. Right. And and so we need to be really careful about what do I actually want to get out of this this behavior? And if you're able to answer that question, man, that, that can take what you're doing in a totally different direction. All right, let's move on to our... Next question. This is from Karina. Karina writes, I really want to declutter my life, but feel guilty about doing so because most of my possessions were paid for by my parents. And I wouldn't want to seem ungrateful by getting rid of all the stuff they've provided me with all my life. Any advice for people who may not yet have their own income and whose family might not be into minimalism? Yeah. Um, you know, th- this, there's no harm. We were just talking uh, to our producer, Sean, about this, and he was like, you know, my mom will do this, get me something, and uh, if I don't use it or if I don't need it, I will, and I need to get rid of it. It's no longer serving a purpose or bringing me joy. I'll go back to her and say, hey, do you want this back? And I think there's no, there's no harm in asking that question to your parents. That's probably where I would start. So if I was in your position, I'd probably go to your parents and I'd have a conversation. I'd start the conversation off with something like, wow, mom and dad, you are great. You've given me all this stuff. You've given me a great life. I really, really appreciate it. And I want to make sure uh, that the stuff that you've provided me uh, is getting the most use. It, it, uh, it, people are um, getting the most use out of it. So is there anything uh, that I have that you want back that you feel like you could get use out of? Or is there anything that I have that you absolutely don't want me to get rid of? And if they give you permission to go ahead and let go of some of the things that they've purchased for you and uh, that is no longer serving a purpose or bringing you joy, then yeah, great. Get rid of it. Uh, Go donate it so someone else can get use out of it. Or maybe you need to buy, I don't know, a refrigerator, or maybe you really do want to play a guitar and you don't have a guitar yet and you need to to buy a guitar. You go to your parents and say, I'm going to sell some of this stuff so I can buy X. Uh, There are plenty of ways to approach that. So Having a having a conversation, being loving, being honest with your parents, this is really uh, what's going to help you get through this this decision that you're trying to to make right now. And ask yourself whether or not your parents want you to hold on to something that isn't bringing you joy, something that isn't Great serving point. a purpose in your life. Do you do you really think that they're going to think of you as ungrateful uh, because you're wanting to let go of something that's no longer serving a purpose? No. In fact, if if I was your dad, I might look at at you and say. Wow, you're holding on to something you're not getting any joy from at all, and you feel obligated? Wow, that's not being grateful for the thing that you had. Because here's the nice thing. You can be grateful about the thing, and you can also let it go later when it's no longer serving a purpose. We all, we all live through seasons, and, and so does our stuff, mm. right? And so this thing in my life, this widget in my life, had its season, and it went from spring to summer to fall, and now it's winter, and it's time for it to to find a, a new home. Find someone else who can get value from that thing, and maybe you can make some money from it along the way, or maybe you can just get some more value because you've gotten the excess out of the way, and that allows you to start to focus on what's important to you, which clearly aren't these things. Uh, so you were grateful that your parents got these things for you, Right. And that's great that you, sh- you can show your gratitude through your actions, but holding on to them out of obligation is not an a action that is congruent with gratitude. Uh, keep that in mind as you're holding on to things that no longer serve a purpose. All right. Our last question is from Robin. Robin writes, how or where do I even start following your suggestions slash advice? Your podcast, your first book? Well, Robin, just go ahead and purchase everything. In fact, purchase two copies of everything and give them out to your friends and family. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you can go to theminimalists.com slash start. That's where I would tell you to start. There's a lot of uh, free content, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things you can dive into if you're an audio 
learner, if you, if you learn better audio, then yeah, start with the podcasts. If you learn better by reading, then start with uh, our essays. Um, but yeah, uh, first place is theminimalists.com slash start. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, you can check out our TEDx talk, which is on that start page as well. And uh, in terms of books, if you really want to take a, a deep dive, uh, Robin, I'm going to send you a copy of Everything That Remains. That, that's the book that I recommend uh, starting with. And then if you want to dive deeper from there, because that's really the why to book, the, the, the book that goes through my journey and Ryan's journey from suit and tie corporate guys living the conventional American dream that wasn't making us happy to becoming the minimalist or first month, just minimalists and then the minimalists and, and that whole journey uh, over a five year span. And uh, from there, you can go to Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. That covers the five values of living more intentionally. And our, our essay collection, which is called Essential, is the third book I would recommend. That sort of rounds out the trilogy. That's more of the how-to book. It has 12 different uh, chapters of, of 12 different themes from minimalism and stuff to gift-giving and passion and finances and, and everything in between, uh, mindful living. And all of these areas uh, of living a more intentional, more deliberate life. And, and we let you sort of focus on those one essay at a time. There's 150 essays in, in that collection. So, Robin, you can start there. Uh, anyone else who's interested in any of those books, you can just go to your local library and uh, you can usually find a copy there. If you can't, they can generally order them for you. And if you decide to make a, a purchase of one of our books, that, that's fine. But we encourage you to minimize it afterward. You can find them used online as well. Uh, or you can, uh, w- once you've read it, you realize the value is in the words. The value isn't in the artifact itself. So pass it on to someone else who, who certainly can get more value from it than if it just sits on your shelf uh, forever. All right, Ryan, we should move on to our added value portion of the show. This is where we each recommend – we didn't talk about this beforehand. I hope we're not going to recommend the same thing. Um, (laughs) This is where we each recommend something that has added value to our lives before. uh, Because we're talking about consumerism today, uh, there's a book called Stuffocation by James Wallman. Uh, He's a British journalist who wrote a a journalistic approach toward – uh, this this consumer culture that we've been steeped in, and and so in Stuffocation he he takes very much the the journalist's approach with with facts and figures and stories and quotes. In fact, the book opens with uh, opening chapter with Ryan and his his story <laughs> of of going through this this interesting packing party. So Stuffocation is probably the best title of of any book that I, I wish I would have had uh, because it perfectly encapsulates. Uh, this consumerism idea. We are suffocating with stuff. Mm. We are suffocated. My recommendation, I, I just had my family over. It was crazy, man. We had uh, seven people in my two-bedroom apartment. And it was, well, it's funny because like... <laughs> like it's yeah, not a big two-bedroom no, apartment. No, it's not. It's, uh, <laughs> I have two couches and I had an air mattress, so like two family members shared the guest bedroom, and then two slept, you know, one on each couch and then one on the air mattress. But I was like totally looking at it, like, oh my god, like I actually I'm doing this. I'm actually doing this in a small place, and I've got all these people staying with me, and it was not uncomfortable. It was it was fine. But while they were over, uh, my mom, she was like, Ryan, I really want you to sit down and watch this documentary called Racing Extinction. And I kind of looked it up, and it was about. Um, it's an environmental movie, and I got to be honest, man. Like I am so, uh, I'm tired of being dragged around the block emotionally with, you know, the environmental stuff. So I was, yeah. but it was for my mom. And I'm like, okay, I'll watch it. It was an awesome movie, man. And that's what I'm going to recommend is Racing Extinction. And the reason why it was awesome, the reason why I really appreciated it, was because uh, it still was, you know, this emotional roller coaster, um, but it just gave a perspective on what we're doing to this earth that I have not seen before. So if you're, especially, especially if there's someone out there who like really wants to get through to their, you know, a friend or a family member, just to help them have a little bit different of a perspective. I think this movie would do a good job of, of helping people change their perspective on how they are consuming and uh, how they are affecting this planet. So racing extinction, um, you can get it at a couple different places. I'm not going to sit here and name all the sites, but just yeah, we'll, Google we'll, it and you'll... We'll throw links to, to that and, yeah. and suffocation in the show notes to, to this episode as well, so you'll be able to check that out. 
uh, at theminimalists.com slash podcast. Let's move on to our next segment, which we call Right Here, Right Now. This is where we stop talking about us and start talking about us. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we, uh, we could talk about some of the stuff we have going on right now. Uh, Ryan, this episode, even though we are recording it, um, like, what is today? March 8th? It won't post until March 29th on, on the blog. So you all on Periscope, you're getting this way, way early. Congratulations. Um, but uh, when it does post, we, we do have, we'll be a month away from going on tour. So wow. we have a, a bunch of different cities. Let me see if I can remember these, Ryan. We are going to start in New York City on May 1st. Yes. And then, man, it's going to be a whirlwind tour for the next 31 days. Uh, we are going to be here. Here, Fact check me here, Ryan. I'm going to be in, we're going to be in New York City. Sean's coming with us, our, our trusted producer, Sean. Now, wh- why is that important? Because we're going to do a live version of this podcast on the road. And we're going to answer your questions after the film screens as well. So you're paying to see the, the film, which you're, you're really paying in the theater. We make very – actually, we're going to lose money on the tour. But that's okay um, because we're, we're getting out there and we get to interact with a bunch of people. But um, – Sean will be with us recording episodes for, for this podcast as well. We're going to be in New York City. And then, Ryan, I'm going to just sound like Howard Dean here. Go for it. We're going to New York City. Yeah. And then we're going to Boston. Yep. And then Washington, D.C. And then Miami. And then <laughs> Dallas. And then Dayton. And Chicago. And Seattle. And San Francisco. And Los Angeles. And Salt Lake City. And Missoula. And Toronto. And then we're going to take back the White House. <laughs> wow! Is that the only? Is that the only way you can remember all those cities? What, doing it like how we're doing. Yeah, no, it's funny because isn't that what they say? Like the more emotion you can tie with something, like the better you can remember it. Anyway, no, I, I, yes, no, that was perfect, dude. That beautiful. was right so, down the list. Uh, I think it's thirteen cities, uh, but the documentary is going to be in four hundred cities. So please get your tickets now at minimalismfilm.com. Uh, just click on see the film, find the theater close to you. It'll be in about four hundred cities, and if you're overseas. Don't worry. We're still working on overseas distribution. We're going to start with Canada and Australia, and then we're going to branch out from there. And eventually, we'll have some online distribution, too. So we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to, to see this film. We're really proud of it. It's one of the best things we've ever done. Our director, Matt Diavella, is a genius. The folks at Spire Media who helped us out with uh, as producers on the film, they are phenomenal as well. Also, uh, Tuesdays with the Minimalists. Every Tuesday in March and April, we are we're live on Periscope and Twitter, 7 p.m. Eastern, answering your questions on, on that format. So we're actually going to take the questions right there live uh, as you ask them, which we've been enjoying a ton. We've had thousands of people who are also enjoying that. So, so thank you for tuning in to that. All the details uh, to that, theminimalists.com slash Tuesdays. I'm teaching another How to Write Better workshop coming up in June. The last one really filled up, and I have limited seats in, in this one. But you can find all the details at howtowritebetter.org. It's a one-day workshop. The last one I did was a two-hour workshop that was four hours. And, <laughs> and that's, I think it was three or four hours. And we, we just jam-packed it with stuff. And, and we're going to do that again. I also teach a four-week class. But for those of you who can't do that, you can find the one-day workshop uh, and, and at least allocate some time on how to write better, which isn't just how to write better blog posts or stories or novels. All that's included, but it's you could write better business emails. Mm. Uh, that That's something that is important. I think the rising tide lifts all boats, and I want to help out some people with that. That's why I teach a writing class online. And um, finally, you want to talk, Ryan, about, about some meetups? Yeah, don't forget about minimalist.org. We've got 100 cities across the world where there are people – meeting up and discussing things that have to do with minimalism and simplicity. Some groups are doing tiny home tours. Uh, some folks had a minimalist architect come out and give a presentation. Uh, another one um, had a, a you know, professional organizer give a presentation, even though I still think organization is just a, a, a cover-up for well-organized hoarding. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, no, no, I, I do think that organization is, is important. It's, but, you know, when you have gotten rid of all your stuff, uh, I know I like to stay as organized as I can. But anyway, um, yeah, go to minimalist.org to find your local meetup. If you go to minimalist.org and you don't see your city there, that's all right. We still have a group that you can meet with at the online city. You can join that. There are 
gosh, I think it's over 2,000 people there now. Um, and it, that page, I can't even keep up with it. There's just like so much. That's uh, awesome. So yeah. much going on. Yeah. So and, and there's so many resources people are sharing. Right. So when you go to minimalist.org and you click on your city, and it, it, like, they're free group, groups. We don't want anything from you. Right. We don't require your email address or anything like that. Uh, it takes you to all these different Facebook groups, and uh, you can find your group for your city. And people share best practices. They share articles. They share resources. Uh, you can find accountability partners in there. Yeah. Uh, because this is posting so close to the, the first of the month, we might as well recommend 30-Day Minimalism Game, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's right around the corner, a new month. So uh, play the 30-Day Minimalism Game, find an accountability partner, team up, and you can find all the details for that at theminimalists.com slash game. Yeah, I was going to say minimalist.org. Uh, there's a ton of a ton of accountability peop, uh, folks there that people can uh, rely on. I mean, people there, are, there are groups. It's like, yeah, it's like every single day I'll just see like, you know, all these posts of pictures of stuff people are getting rid of. So, yeah, if you're looking for help, if you're looking for support, go to uh, minimalist.org. All yeah. right. F- let's, uh, let's listen to some voicemail comments uh, from our listeners. Hi, guys. My name is Dominique, and I'm from Calgary, Alberta. Thanks so much for your awesome podcast. I wanted to share some advice a friend gave me about letting go of items you've recently acquired that have turned out not to have have brought you a lot of value. Let's say, for example, the item is a $50 shirt you bought a few weeks ago, but you haven't worn it. Instead of looking at the money spent as being on the item itself, assign it to the learning experience instead. Take the item and go through some questions about it, like, what seems so appealing about it in the first place? Would I have been as likely to go back and buy it a day later, a week later? Do I already have something similar at home? Does that thing already bring me serviceable value? Would I be willing to let go of something at home when this new item replaced it? Even if you want something intrinsic for your money, you can write down some notes about the purchase letdown experience or send yourself an email, and the value has now come from the learning experience and not from the object itself. That makes it much easier to let go of. Hey guys, my name's Erin. I'm calling from Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, and I just wanted to comment on your sentimental podcast. Today in particular, I chose to sell some diamond earrings that my parents gave me as a graduation gift years ago, and I don't wear them because I just don't wear them. And I told my dad today that I, I sold them, and he passed the message on to my mother, who just called me to tell me that I shouldn't have gotten rid of them because... It was a sentimental item, and I should have hung on to it. And I told her, you know what, Mom, this is part of my minimalist challenge. I needed to get rid of the sentimental items. I'm sorry, but I don't wear them. And in the future, I'm going to maybe buy myself some bigger ones. (laughs) And she said, you know, okay, fine, I get it. And, you know, you got a good price. So, you know, that's okay. Hey, Josh and Ryan. My name is uh, Zach from Kingston, New York. Um, I was just calling regarding something mentioned on the last podcast about consumerism and about uh, one person has a question about feeling guilty after they made a purchase. Um, one of the things that really helped me in my minimalism journey is um, is really thinking about the impact that our purchases make. And I read once that every purchase is a vote. And if you view your consumption in this way, you'll really – purchase things in a much more intentional way. So, for instance, I love a Big Mac, but I'm not going to purchase one because I've informed myself about some of McDonald's practices. I um, I watched this documentary called The True Cost, which told me a lot about the way clothing is made and who it impacts, and that has influenced the way I buy clothing and these sorts of things. So if you educate yourself about those processes, it's almost a way of naturally minimalizing because you're able to purchase much more deliberately and intentionally and know what the impact of that purchase is. All right, y'all, that is it for this episode. If you have a question for The Minimalists, give us a call at 406-219-7839. And if you leave here with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need 
Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for and you gotta grab Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it So tear your eyes away Or tear 